unmute Elton. And uh, everyone is super welcome to ask questions. To do so, please raise your hand in the Zoom uh, or write in the chat. And in any case, I'll uh, welcome you to ask your questions. Questions welcome. Okay. Hi. Uh, yeah. So thanks, everyone. So. Um, I, did, I decided to do this very boomer thing of doing some slide talk, which I haven't done in a long time. Because <laughs> I sort of wanted to, you know, make the field friendly to a lot of newcomers, especially, and show the faces behind, um, you know, the mathematics that comes into this talk. And uh, yeah, but unfortunately, as I went through the photos, it turns out that, uh, you know, our field, even though it's a very friendly and nice field, has a diversity problem. and. Um, <laughs> Uh, hopefully, uh, we will re repair that in the coming years. So this is joint work with uh, Akil Matthew and Jakob Witaschek. Um, I think Jakob is here. Uh, and yeah, so this talk doesn't really belong to any like tradition or whatever. It's just some like fun observation that we learn in MSRI. So um, right, so here's a general K-theoretic phenomenon slash question. And some of it has been, has been alluded to in, um, in Bova's talk. So uh, suppose you have a commutative square of schemes, so W, Y, C, and X, I just generically written like that. Um, so you apply uh, the non-connective K3 functor and we get a diagram of spectra. Um, so I guess, can, can, can people see the ink, the ink notation? Yes. Um, yes. Yes? Yes. Okay. So the question is, uh, is this diagram Cartesian? So that's, that's often something that you wanna, there's a general format that you can ask and you know, Vova talked about you, you, you have some square of stacks or schemes or whatever you apply K theory, you want to know if this diagram is Cartesian. Okay, so if yes, the upshot is that you get this long as X sequence from Ki of X, Ki uh, Y directs some Ki of Z into Ki W with this boundary map going Ki minus one down and usually helps in a lot of computations. And um, an example of such a phenomenon is uh, this theorem due to Thomson and Trobel. So I don't know how Trobel looks like, um, but here's Thomson's photo uh, that I ripped off from the internet. And um, Thomson uh, taught us the following, uh, the following uh, example of this, of this phenomenon. So in this case, you have X's scheme, uh, QCQS probably, and then you have an open immersion U inside X. So J is open, as I, as I wrote. And then P is a tau, okay? And then on the closed complement, so you have a, maybe a, let me just draw it in. So you have this closed complement, uh, which is X minus U, maybe the reduced structure. And you have a map uh, to the inverse image of such, the inverse of X minus U. And just like the Milner squares that um, Vova talked about, I demand that this is an isomorphism. Uh, and nowadays, this has a name, it's called the Nisnevich square, and uh, most of you uh, know, know this. Um, and in this, in this case of an Nisnevich square, um, the answer is indeed positive. So you get a Cartesian square of spectra. Uh, and this is a result of Thomson and Trobel. This is like, you know, a result of this uh, Trobel simulacrum that told Thomson, or you can like do some trick to actually prove this result. And, uh, by, and by a result of Morel and Voivodsky, um, this means that um, this is a Nisnevich shift. So there's some topology called the Nisnevich topology which is uh, finer than the Zariski topology, but coarser than the Etal topology. And K theory has descent with respect to this topology. So this was uh, kind of a major breakthrough, and, um, but currently it's like fully internalized in the subject. Like, you know, this is like the first thing you tell like some young kid trying to do uh, K theory or something, you tell you, oh, you know, K theory has this uh, Nisnevich descent, but doesn't have an Etal descent, and therefore there's a lot of problems in computing algebra K theory. But back in the day, this was like, I don't know, I think there are like a lot of seniors here, like uh, more senior people in the subject, like, like Bert or Oliver or Paul, who will tell us that uh, this was like a really major thing um, when Thomson first proved this. Um, right, so another example, which is maybe less well known, um, is this gluing square. So you have a Noetherian commutative ring A and just an element T in A. So maybe I pick some random prime inside the integers, right? So from there, you can form the following square. So you have, uh, a completed at T at T and then you have uh, A with T inverted so invert T so if it's uh, prime number P you have like the P uh, and then you have like Z1 over P and on the other hand you can apply the completion first and then invert T which is not necessarily zero 
It's an exercise if you're bored to check that uh, the other thing is zero. Uh, and this is a, a square of interest and is usually called an arithmetic fracture square. And uh, visually, it's like gluing along a punctured tubular neighborhood, right? So this is like a tubular neighborhood. And this is like puncturing the tubular neighborhood. And if you are trying, if you take spec of it, you imagine you're gluing along like some punctured tubular neighborhood. Okay, so that's another kind of square that um, does not fit uh, into this Nisnevich framework, which is completely new. And it turns out also by results of Thomson and Trobal by just a the localization theorem that the answer is again positive. That indeed you can compute the K theory of A by looking at the K theory of the completion, the K theory of the T inversion guy, and uh, the ET inversion of the completed guy. And the idea is just the fibers of the K theory T power torsion objects, and then some uh, localization sequence that Thomson proved or uh, later uh, generalized by Niemann shows you that the fibers of this map and this map, so the fibers are just equivalent and is, equ and is the K theory of T power torsion objects. Okay, that's kind of nice. That's another instance of this phenomenon. And then, and, yeah. You mean that vertical fibers are the people, the T power? Uh, sorry, sorry, yeah, vertical fibers. I mean, thank you. Yeah, so the, the vertical fibers, thank you. All right, nice. So, um, so here's a non-example. So here's Jack Milner. Uh, you have a square of schemes, W, Y, Z, X. Uh, this is a notation ripped off from a, a very recent paper. Um, so it's said to be a Milner square if it's bi-Cartesian, so it's both a push-out and a pullback. So the same thing that Bova talked about this morning, where Z is a closed immersion and the map P, Y to X is an affine map. So you think about this, for example, when Say P itself is a, ah, sorry, P should be, so, uh, <laughs> so don't look at the, don't look at the, uh, the names of the map, just look at the, where, where the domain and codomains go. So this is a bi-Cartesian square of schemes, and Z is a closed immersion, and Y to X is affine. So for example, Y to X will also be a closed immersion itself, and if it's bi-Cartesian, you should be thinking of gluing uh, two schemes together to get X, right? So for example, you can like glue the point, uh, you can glue like two affine lines along the common points to get to get the coordinate axis. That's another example. That's uh, one example of this, this kind of square. And uh, this turns out to be negative in general. It turns out to be a non-example. Um, so uh, K theory does not, in general, converts Milner to Cartesian square. As uh, already been discussed this morning, uh, but it's okay if we modify K theory a bit. So there's this version of algebraic K theory called homotopy invariant K theory, where uh, we force K theory to be uh, homotopy invariant, so A1 invariant. In other words, the value of K theory at A1 of S is isomorphic with the K theory of S. Yeah. Uh, and even though this has nothing to do with Miller squares, it turns out that you can prove, well, Chuck can prove, that uh, the algebraic K theory, that this, this version of algebraic K theory does um, satisfy Milner excision. In other words, it converts this Milner squares to a, a, a Cartesian square. So, okay, then, um, of course, another modification is you can look at this pro version of the Milner square, and this was discussed by Bova, and that's much deeper than this result, but uh, we will not really do that. Okay. So, um, today's goal, and that's Jakub's photo, uh, it's time for you to laugh, Jakub. So in the framework above, uh, we would like to study the behavior of K-theory under something called universal homeomorphisms, which I will discuss. And uh, it's really inspired by uh, Jakub's recent work on uh, mixed characteristic minimal model program, and I'll sort of uh, discuss this in a couple of slides later. Uh, and and what, what I find fun about this, this, this project is that it's really a combination of this uh, DAC and DAC program and MSRI that ran last year. So there was this DAC program called derived algebraic geometry where I was part of, and then there's this other program called the birational algebraic geometry that Jakub was part of. And somehow like people actually spoke to each other and um, you know, some things came out. It's kind of exciting thing. And that's MSRI right there, uh, below Jakub. Okay. So, let me explain uh, universal homeomorphisms through uh, several examples. Um, so this will be a very <laughs> example-based uh, uh, section of the, of the talk. Okay, are there, are there any questions so far? 
And um, I want to abbreviate universal homeomorphisms as UH, following um, Shane Kelly. <laughs> uh, so a universal homeo uh, is a map of schemes, right? So which is, homeo which is a homeomorphism of underlying topological spaces. So that's the first condition that you demand, right? And, uh, but something more interesting is that you demand it to be uh, to, to, to still be a homeomorphism after pull back along arbitrary maps. So in other words, if you have a map from S to Y and you take a map from X to Y, X, yeah, so this X to Y, F, and you have a map from S to Y, then you take the pullback, uh, so X cross Y of S, this induced map uh, is also a, a homeomorphism. And it turns out that this will, you know, the, 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 you know, the class of maps, which are actual universal homeomorphisms differs in, in quite a drastic manner with those which are just homeomorphisms and you can actually, well, if, if uh, it will, it will, an, an example that de demonstrates this will come up in a couple of slides, but um, you should think about the difference immediately. So here's a first example, which is actually a universal homeomorphism. So if you have a, a closing, uh, if you have a scheme, so just any random scheme, and you can consider the following. So you can cons consider the reduced locus of X, right? So, uh, so locally, you know, X is modeled by some ring. Uh, and the reduced locus is just, the, this map is just the spec of the map that takes A, and modeled by like you know the new new potent new 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 potents, yeah. Let's make it reduced. Um, so it's a closed immersion, which is actually a universal homeomorphism. And more generally, any nil potent immersion. So any uh, closed immersion, if a nil potent uh, ideal shift, uh, is a general case of a uh, of, of a universal homeomorphism. So you only really care about the underlying topological information of X. And uh, this, uh, and of course, uh, you should expect this kind of killing nilpotence to be such an example. And it's kind of weird, right? So you know, we study schemes, uh, and the reason why we study schemes is so like we we want to keep track of this nilpotence. You sort of want to care about uh, this extra nilpotent information uh, according to Grothendieck. Um, so maybe Grothendieck at this point will be like rolling in his grave. It's like, oh my God, why are you looking at this? But it turns out that he himself was interested in this universal homeomorphisms. Um, yeah, but nonetheless, uh, we, we push on. So here's another example. Uh, suppose X is now an FP scheme, and FP is code word for having this wonderful map called the Frobenius map, which is the identity under underlying topological space, uh, in particular a homeomorphism. And um, the unstructured sheets is given by, P, by, by the P power map, right? So locally, it's really modeled by the map from A to A, which are a map of FP algebras to send X to X to the P. Okay, cool. Um, so in fact, there's also a version called the relative Frobenius, which I will not revise, but uh, you might have in mind another kind of Frobenius, which is defined after pullback or something like this. And in fact, that's also a universal homeomorphism. Okay, that's a, just a quick remark. So the proofs of all of this is like nicely written up in the Stacks project. Yeah. I, uh, I encourage you to look at that. Um, and here's, a, here's an, um, a, a very important consequence of the Frobenius being a universal homeomorphism. So you begin with an FP scheme called X. Then you can consider this thing called X perf. Okay, so this is the inverse limit of the Frobenius map. So this is equal to, so you take X and you take this F map, right, Frobenius. That's my credit limit. So look at it. Uh, so you have this uh, system, and you can take the limits of this diagram in the category of FP schemes. And the resulting scheme you get is uh, something called uh, the per perfection, and it's perfect in the sense that the Frobenius is invertible. Yeah, so it's a perfect scheme in the sense that uh, the Frobenius map is invertible. In general, this x perf is very non theorem and very, very big, but nonetheless, it has a very nice uh, property that is actually uh, that is a perfect scheme. And, 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 and as you know, a lot of um, developments these days in, uh, you know, in, in this arithmetic geometry is about looking at perfectoid rings. Uh, so those are very complicated, and, uh, but this is a very simple version, namely a perfect scheme. So those schemes where the Frobenius map is invertible. Okay. Um, okay, so that's nice. 
Uh, Elton, is, yes. it, is it easy to see that uh, this map is universal for memorphism? Um, yeah, it requires an argument. You should, you should look at this text project. It's not immediate. Okay. Okay. So, so one very nice thing about uh, the Frobenius is that you can state a very nice uh, structural result about general, at least finite universal homeomorphisms um, in characteristic P. So this is a theorem due to originally to, to Janos Kolar and um, with some additional hypothesis that Shane removed in this um, little note. Is Shane here, by the way? No, he's not. So um, something that uh, some hypothesis, I mean, so, so Shane wrote up a very, uh, nice uh, exposition of this result and remove some unnecessary hypothesis. So the result goes as follows. So you have a reduced quasi-compact FP scheme. Okay. And you have a finite universal homeomorphism called uh, F from T to S. Then one, there exists two things. So there exists an N, when I write Q equals to P to the N, and a map F minus Q, which goes the other direction, rendering the above diagram commutative. So in other words, uh, so you 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 go you go you apply t first, you apply f first, sorry, and then you apply this f minus q, and then it factors the Frobenius. Okay. Uh, so in other words, uh, any finite universal homeomorphism of FP schemes factors to a high enough power of the Frobenius. So 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 more or less finite uh in characteristic P is some power sort of Frobenius. It's like sort of the slogan that you want, might want to think about. And um, if you if you think about uh, universal homeomorphism, that is the finite ones uh, over FP as just being a combination of Frobenii and uh, no potent emergence, uh, because I, I emphasize, emphasize this word reduce, then you are in good shape. And that's pretty much like the only interesting uh, universal homeomorphisms that, that could happen. Adam, can you wait a yes. sec? You're going fast, and not all of us can follow as fast. Yes. So, uh, okay. So, the theorem says, I'm just trying to digest it. So, before you move away the slide, and I'll never see the diagram yes. again, uh, that uh, if you have universal homomorphism, you can construct an inverse, right? And an inverse, but not really an inverse. It's like a Frobenius. It's like a if you think about it, Frobenius is invertible, you can invert it. Ah, an inverse up to Frobenius. So like yes. on, on perfectoid, it would be an actual inverse. On perfect on, schemes, yes. Sorry, uh -huh. perfect uh -huh. schemes. Uh -huh. be, okay. Uh -huh. yep. Inverse up to Frobenius. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so so I like I like that. So let me write that. So inverse up to Frobenius. Okay. So Frobenius power, okay. So right, so let me emphasize again, like, like you shouldn't be scared of this things over FP because they're basically just like nilpotent immersions, uh, uh, then Frobenius, and then you know if you're not finite, if you're not finite type, you should do some notion approximation, but I will not go into that. Okay, so here's a non-example. Uh, whoops. Okay, so here um, it's slightly like the situation that you know in like undergrad that people like. So in undergrad, you might have taken a class in Galois and people tell you that Galois extensions of fields are good, are good and uh, inseparable extensions are like terrible. But, um, if, but Galois extensions are not uh, universal homeomorphisms. So if you have a map from spec L to spec K, obviously it's like point to point, right? So it's like a homeomorphism. However, uh, because it's Galois, you have this like isomorphism, you have this decomposition. So what you get is that you have spec L to spec K, and you take the pullback along itself. Ah, this should be a product, right? Then this thing splits. This becomes like uh, G copies of spec L. Right. So of course, this has like, you know, if G is non-trivial, this is not a homeomorphism. Right. So that's a that's a non example that you should keep in mind. We're sort of like, if you're interested in universal homeomorphisms, that you should like throw Galois theory entirely uh, out of your mind, um, which may or may not be a healthy thing to do. But um, yeah, so that's a that's the third example. I mean, that's a non example. Okay. 
Uh, any questions about, about this? Okay. So here's a, an example and a non-example that, that comes up under the umbrella of just normalization. So X is a scheme and X new is this text project for normal sex project notation for normalization. So I'm going to adopt it. So this is normalization. Of course, I need some assumptions on X to, for it to exist, but suppose it exists. Actually, so there are two kinds. Hmm? Sorry. Can I ask about yeah. the last example? So, yes. but you, like the splitting gives you a summarism of schemes, no? So how can. No, it's a co product. Ah. ah. This is like. 20 points or something, or like 15 points, and then this is one point. Sorry. Yeah, this... Never mind. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, so 15 is not one. Okay, so, uh, right. So there are two kinds of normalizations that happens in like, uh, for a curve. Right? So some, some scheme um, over, some non-normal scheme over uh, a field. So it looks either like this, which is the case of a cuspidal of the cusp, and the case of the node. So, uh, visibly, you can see that these are homeomorphisms. So, so you're, you're normalizing the cusp, uh, and the normalization is an A1. And visibly, the thing is a homeomorphism, and you can, in fact, check that it is a universal homeomorphism. On the other hand, if you look at the node, the, the normalization is also, uh, is also the, the A1, right? And maybe uh, the best way to, I mean, you should think about it as like, you know, some stairs, some, some helix, like just pinching down. Um, and in this in this situation, uh, this is not a well, not even a homeomorphism. Okay, and um, in fact, the more, a more general theorem is that as long as X is integral and unibranch, so unibranch is like literally like single branch. So this this like node is not unibranch. <laughs> but the official definition is that this uh, the strict Hanselization is irreducible. So if you just Hanselize around this point, you see that you get something like a cross. Uh, then the normalization map uh, is a universal homeomorphism. So that dismisses this, this, this nodal case, but proves the, um, the, the cuspidal case. Okay. Cool. So, um, so these are like four different examples. So let me just uh, summarize it. Uh, so example one is that nil emergence. Example two uh, is this Frobenius map. Example three, which is a non-example, is Galois extensions. And example four, which can be an example or a non-example, are normalizations. Yeah, so if you are like arithmetically inclined, you might think about examples from things like the Frobenius and, and Galois theory. And if you're geometrically uh, minded, you might think about like this normalization. And if you're like, you know, you like algebraic geometry at all, then you should think about this null immersion business. Okay, uh, so later uh, I want to appeal to some general structure theorem for a ring extension to be a universal homeomorphism. And um, it turns out that really uh, any, uni any universal homeomorphism is a mix of all these four examples. Okay, uh, cool. So that, those are very concrete stuff. The very, uh, you know, we're just looking at like normalizing curves, right? Like very, very concrete. So. I want to talk about um, sort of more philosophical idea why you want to be interested in universal homeomorphisms. And it's in a letter from Groth and Dick that's like the young version of the guy and get faultings. So uh, Groth and Dick wrote to faultings. He said, uh, you should treat a universal homeomorphism of schemes as the algebraic geometric analog of what a weak equivalence is in algebraic topology. So let us recall that a morphism of spaces x to y is said to be a weak equivalence if, if you apply the homotopy groups on x to y, so you look at pi i of x to pi i of y, computed with respect to some base point in x, right? It's an isomorphism for all i and for all base points. So that's like a, that's a definition of um, what it means to be a weak to be a to be a weak equivalence uh, and slightly weaker as a, as a as the name suggests to being a homotopy equivalence. Um, right, and Whitehead tells us, however, that it's like, well, okay, sorry. So the whole point of studying uh, something up to weak equivalence uh, is that if you're interested in a space only up to weak equivalence, then you can like try and solve some algebraic problem, right? You can just like 
reduce things to some some pure algebra. Uh, and and you should be very happy because you know presumably you think that algebra is somewhat easier than topology. Of course, that's like sort of not true. But uh, right, so so weak equivalence translates a topological problem to something which is purely algebraic. But it, in fact, uh, the process of going to from from a space to its like weak equivalence type is not very lossy. You don't lose too much because of this classical theorem of Whitehead. Again, one of these classical theorems, which was revolutionary back in the day, but kind of like revolutionary uh, back then, is that uh, if you have if x and y are CW complexes, then weak equivalence implies homotopy equivalence. So, so it's like this algebraic information does capture like the topological nature, the topological information of x and y. Okay. Uh, so, okay, uh, hopefully there's no, any questions there? Okay, uh, right, so, um, so Gothenic posits the following. Okay, he says that studying a scheme up to its etal cohomology, or even better, and uh, you know, this is something that Peter talked about, so it's etal homotopy groups, which are just the uh, homotopy groups of its etal homotopy type. Is equivalent to studying the universal homeomorphism type of the scheme. So this is sort of a parallel to the slogan above, where uh, this is like you know, the version of the Whitehead theorem that Gothenic envisioned, is that um, if you have two finite type schemes whose etal cohomology and etal pi one are equivalent, um, so of course etal cohomology and etal pi one must be taken with respect to all local systems. Uh, then, in fact, uh, it is a universal homeomorphism. So this is like um, the rough, rough version of the, the rough version of what Gutenberg has just said, and I'll make it precise in the next slide. But you should think about uh, the following discussion as a way to make precise um, this idea that you should have a whitehead, you should have a version of the whitehead theorem uh, where you can try and reconstruct uh, the scheme up to its universal homeomorphism type, as long if you're only looking at Etal cohomology and etal pi one. Elton, do you mean that there yeah. is a map of schemes which induces the equivalences? Yes. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to make that more precise in a moment. So this is just a bit, a bit, a bit. Yeah, of course, what has theorem doesn't apply if you don't have a map. But, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's, uh, yeah, so that's the statement of Gothenic's conjecture and why you want to study uh, universal homeomorphisms. And, I didn't really read Guthnick's letter to fall things, but um, presumably there's like some good uh, number theoretic reason why you might want to think uh, in this in this manner. So here's uh, here's the precise statement. So I'm gonna write very shorthandedly. Uh, so x x tilde etal is just uh, the category of uh, etal sheaves of sets. Uh, on the small etal site of X. So this is just the category of etal schemes on X. And then, um, you know, you can end up with the etal topology and you demand a shift condition, uh, very classical things. So here's a, the here's a, here's a theorem due to Grothendieck. In fact, if you have a universal homeomorphism, then uh, there is an equivalence of topoi uh, of this, of these two etal, of the category of etal sheaves on y, and etal sheaves on x. So, uh, if you think, if you, if you uh, think about what, what, um, what was said previously about what has theorem, this is sort of the easy version, namely, um, so analogous to like being homotopy equivalent implies weak equivalence. Um, okay, so this better be true. And then, can I? Can yes. I Interrupt one second. Yeah. But in this theorem, to me, it looks more like saying that a universal homeomorphism behaves like a hom homeomorphism. Like if you think of the etal topos as the underlying topological space of your scheme, yeah, is what I would argue you should think of. Uh, this is saying that if you have a hom universal homeomorphism, this induces uh, an isomorphism of the underlying topoi of your scheme, so to speak. So. It's stronger than being a weak equivalence. Yeah, but, well, but I mean, sheaves of like locally constant sheaves of spaces only depends on the homotopy type, right? The sure, but the topos knows more. The topos is, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, okay, the maybe topos okay. Is essentially, the same data as the uh, I, that Peter was telling us. Uh, fine. Uh, 
You should you should take your complaint to Grossing Dates, not me. <laughs> I can't. Anyway. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So uh okay. Right, so uh, uh right, so I was talking about Grothing's theorem. This is like a you know, he calls this the remarkable equivalence because uh the underlying topos, I mean, given a universal morphism scheme, he induces an equivalence of topo. So the conjecture is that the the passage from uh, a scheme to its uh, et al topo is not very lossy and is captured by the following. So you can look at finite type Z schemes, right? So we can look at finite type Z schemes. And if a functor here given by this formula, so it takes X to the category of et al sheaths on X. And by Grothenik's theorem, it tells you that um, there is a factorization of this, of this map. So you factor through this, thus this is, a, this is just formally inverts. Is it Grothendieck conjecture? Yes. So you formally invert universal homeomorphisms. And this functor, this functor, this one, uh, is conjectured to be fully faithful. In particular, it's like conservative. Huh? It's like, you know, if you're an, you have an, if you, if you, if you have a two, you have a map of schemes, uh, which over a finite type of a Z, which induces an equivalence of topoid, then in fact, uh, they are universally homeomorphic. Sheldon, there is another yes. question. Uh, yes. Bob wanted to ask a question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so is there a derived version of this conjecture where you was, take the localization uh -huh. in, in, the, in the world of infinity categories? Yeah, so I don't know whose term this is due to, but like, I learned this from Clark, that if you invert this universal homeomorphism in the world of infinity categories, you will still remain a one category. And the input amazing. is like Poyabotsky. Cool. Yeah, with also purpose. That's an amazing theorem, yes. And Clark's face will appear at some point. Okay. Can you, can uh, you, what, what is? So this, this inversion should be done in the infinity world, but in fact, it re reproduces a one category. Oh, wow. Okay. Fantastic. So, uh, Vervotsky proved the theorem when I replace Q with Z. So, Q, I replace this with Z. Uh, in, in other words, uh, this, this, this result, this conjecture is a theorem in Karasek zero. Uh, due to uh, Vervotsky himself. So I guess this, this talk belongs to the what not version, but at least this is uh, the what not that Vervotsky did before motivic homotopy theory. Um, so that's kind of cool. And uh, to address like, you know, maybe Vova's uh, question is in the next slide. So Barwick, Glassman, and Hain in the same paper that uh, Peter talked about, prove that um, you can also enhance this to infinity topoi. So this is like the infinity category of like maybe hypercomplete et al sheaves um, on X, on et al X, then in fact, uh, it is fully faithful. So, so this is an infinity version. So that's an old picture of Clark and I thought it would be like a nice tribute to the fact that this was sort of, a, you know, one of his earlier projects. I don't know if Clark is here, but yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is one of his early, earlier pet projects. So that's all and that's, Either, if you don't know how the guy looks like. So, so now I want to ask the same questions, but in the world of algebra K, yes. Can I go back for a second? So uh, is it just the same thing over Q or? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wait, so what's the difference between this and Vyvotsky? Vyvotsky is one categorical. Ah, oh, I see, okay. Yes. Okay, uh, so, so now I want to talk about there's the Harry, Harry wants to tell you something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so just really quick. Um, Voivodsky's proof is not uh, in the full generality that, that we want, so it's still open. Uh, there's, uh, it, he only proved it in the case where the schemes are normal rather than semi-normal, which is equivalent to being in the co-localization on the universal homeomorphisms. Okay. So it's not fully proved in characteristic zero even. It's it's nice. I doubt that, but uh, maybe I'll talk to you later. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Well, um, yes. Okay. Cool. So here's a here's a question. So, right. So 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 the title of this talk was like the K theory of universal homomorphisms. So I want to understand uh, the goal is to understand the interaction between K theory or some version of it versus UH. 
Uh, you want to know how they, the behavior of algebraic K theory and universal homeomorphisms. So I don't know. I don't know why anyone will ask this question, but somehow we did. <laughs> and uh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so is K theory invariant or universal homeomorphism? That's the first question you should ask. So this is the analog of this uh, very early Guthnick theorem uh, in for algebraic K theory. Okay. So the answer is no, and here are some examples. Uh, so if K is characteristic P, then we can look at K1 of K, which is just the unit group. Then you can look at a Frobenius map and plainly see that uh, unless K is perfect, then this is not generally an isomorphism. It's not generally an isomorphism. Okay. Uh, so you can ask, how about in characteristic zero? So by looking at K1, uh, you can just look at, you can just plug in C, and you look at a dual number, so like you know some thickening of the points, and plainly uh, the algebraic K theory of of this of this thickened point and the K algebraic K theory of the point are just different. We're looking at K one, for example, you know, units and like units in the thickening units are sort of sensitive to the thickenings. Okay, so in characteristic P is bad, in characteristic zero is also bad. So let me give you more bad uh, more badness. So and and maybe right even though well. The fact that I'm giving this talk at all means there's some kind of positive answer, but the positive answer is sort of um, inspired very much by this negative answer, which is something over um, characteristic zero. So let's 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 say k is characteristic zero, and we want to consider uh, this 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 um, picture, right? So this uh, normalization of the cuspidal curve. So this map is in general not an isomorphism. So this is the normalization map. Which is a universal homeomorphism between this cuspidal curve and this A1. So let's see what happens. So, uh, so Chuck came out already, and that's, that's Sue Geller, and that's uh, Les Reed. And Geller Reed Weibel uh, considered uh, the situation of trying to understand the cuspidal curve uh, versus the algebraic K theory of A1. So the answer is kind of nice. Um, so this is in characteristic zero, and I mean, let me just say that in characteristic P, this is like geyser hasselhoff But uh, this is less relevant to, to like the ideas of this talk. So I'm just over a field, and it puts, so therefore algebraic K theory is A1 invariant, so that's the left-hand side, right? So it's just like points. But the right-hand side, uh, the homotopy, they, they completed the homotopy groups on the, the higher algebraic K theory of, the, of C, they should be C instead of A. So there's Kn of K plus some terms. So what are these terms? Okay, so this is the, the computation. So the term involves three uh, sum ends, two copies of this thing called Vn's, and uh, the, 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 you know, these relative differentials uh, of, of degree n uh, of k over q. Okay, and this Vn also, also uh, consists of relative differentials and you can see them here, it's not that important, but maybe let me point uh, to something that when n equals to zero one, right? I mean, the color examples for this no potent stuff and for Benia stuff already happens in k1, but to, to see the difference between the algebra k theory of the, cuspidal curve and A1, you need to at least go to degree two and above. And in degree two and above, these differentials, this uh, kilo differentials uh, starts popping up. And, and uh, the, the guilty, you know, the guilty party, the reason why uh, these two things differs is of course coming from a negative cyclic homology, which I will not uh, talk about, but if you're an expert in these things, then uh, you should you should really be a uh, yeah, smell the the fishy smell of HC minus contributing to these things because it has something to do with differential forms. And you know this is one of the very early methods, uh, the early early demonstration of the power of the trace methods that you can sort of tell the difference between the algebraic K theory of uh, the cuspidal curve versus the algebraic K theory of E one. And noting that uh, it is some is a very purely higher phenomenon. You can't really look at it on the level of units. You can't really look at a level look at it on the level of K zero but you can look at it only on K2 and above. I think that's like a very inspiring uh, work by, by these, th these three people. Um, so, uh, oh, I repeated the slides, I'm sorry. But yeah, 
so that's um that's uh that's where it is. So cyclic homology sort of obstructs the difference. Sort of uh, produces a difference between algebraic K theory and um, of of C and algebraic K theory of A one. So let's talk about the repair. So um, you know we saw that if you don't know how to prove Milner, uh, well, the fact that Milner excision is not true uh, in algebraic K theory leads you to maybe think about other variants of algebraic K theory. So Weibull thought about homotopic K theory and he proves that oh, in fact, they have Milner excisions. So another thing, another variant of algebraic K theory is you, just, you can just invert the prime. So if you invert K1, for example, it turns out that K1 of K, uh, one over P, this FROP example on K1, K disappears. So this counter example disappears. So you suspect that um, maybe uh, P inverted algebraic K theory is invariant under universal homeomorphisms, at least on characteristic P schemes. Right, so I mean, the way, one one reason why you might think that is because of the structure theorem of like Janos Kolar that you should just think about uh, these things as Frobenius. Like finite, finite universal homomorphisms are just more or less just a Frobenius. So, you, so if you if you take care of the Frobenius case, which you can do after, by inverting P, then maybe you have a chance at proving uh, that algebraic K theory with P inverted is invariant under arbitrary universal homomorphisms. And if this is the case, and um, and this is a result in 2018, independently due to myself and Adil, and uh, Matthew Morrow and Shane Kelly, using very different methods. Uh, and here's a baby case of the phenomenon, and I want to replace K theory with PIC, because the solution in characteristic zero that uh, Yakub and Akil and I figured out has uh, has its roots in PIC. So I want to I want to I want to understand why x perf to x is an equivalence after you apply pick one over p, right? So this is the version for pick instead of k theory one over p, okay? Uh, is uh, any questions on what I'm trying to demonstrate now? So I'm just replacing k theory pick and telling you the argument for pick and I'll and tell you that a version of this argument also works for k theory one over p. Okay, so so if you want to invert one over p, you better be taking this colimit, where you you know colimit across multiplication by p. But in characteristic p, you have this very fortunate, well maybe not accident, but fortunate fact of life that multiplication by p can be modeled by the Frobenius pullback of line bundles. Right? I mean, you tensor you, you pull the Frobenius pullback in this is the p power tensor, which is multiplication by p, you know, in this in this uh, in this in this Picard world, but you know, you can commute the co-limit inside and that's exactly uh, what pick X purpose. So then you have this isomorphism. Okay, that's kind of stupid. But yeah, so you can, you can run this argument uh, in, in, in algebra K theory, even though for Benis upper star and P is not a priori like quite related. Okay, cool. So we learned that in order to understand, well, I mean, this is sort of a common theme in algebraic K theory. You want to prove something in algebraic K theory. The first thing you ask is, that, is it true for pick? And you try to prove the thing for pick first, and it seems to be easier. And then you get inspired, and you try to do something about algebraic K theory. OK. Yeah, so uh, this is a little exercise that you can actually uh, do at home. OK. So how about characteristic 0? Okay, so without the Frobenius, as it's, as it's many things, uh, it's not clear what to do in life. <laughs> uh, and also the results of Geller, Weibull, Reed, uh, that uh, rational algebraic K theory is not universal UH invariant. Right? So, right, so the, the discrepancy is inside omega K, like K, omega N, K over Q, and this is already rational. Right. So you cannot further invert anything else. Okay, so 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 what on earth do you do? Uh, well, since it cannot ever be true, you try to measure. You try to measure to what extent it is false. So maybe the idea is measure to what extent uh, the statement. Uh, by the statement, I mean k uh, is uh, 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 uh,
is false. And this is like the approach of like this TC stuff, which gotten really hot recently is that TC measures to what extent algebra K theory is nil invariant via some pullback square. So you will want to like sort of dream up some kind of pullback square that can measure the difference between the failure of algebra K theory to be, uh, to be a universal homeomorphism invariant. And here's the statement. Uh, right, so to phrase the statement, so here, here's what you can do. Suppose you have a morphism over ZP, so we work one prime at a time. Uh, and we can look at this, uh, this locus where P is invertible, so you can take X1 over P and Y1 over P. Right. Uh, and an example is that you just get a stupid square that looks like this, empty, empty, X to Y, whenever uh, you know, X is over ZP, but in fact, it's like concentrated in aspect FP. Right? Right. So suppose X is like purely characteristic P, then you just get X to Y, but this is over ZP, it's of mixed characteristics, so you have some characteristic zero part, and you, you, put it, you put it there. Okay, so you look at this square, which is like not anything. I mean, yeah, it's just some, some square. I mean, it's not like some cover that you thought about before. Uh, and it turns out that uh, you can look at this square. Right, right. So here's the, here's the theorem, and that's a kill. Um, not demonstrating the theorem, demonstrating a way more interesting theorem, I guess. But anyway, so you, you hit the previous square with algebraic K theory, so you get this square. And this is a Cartesian after you invert P. Okay. So that's the theorem. So let me let me let me plug in the case where X and Y are pure characteristic P. Eldon, can, yes. can you so uh, there was a slide like two slides ago. Uh, no, before. Ah, okay. So ah, right, okay. So yes. you're saying that if you invert P, you're good, and if you invert uh, rationals, you're bad, right? Uh, what? No, I mean, in, in characteristic zero, you cannot get rid of the fact that algebraic K theory is just simply not UH invariant, even after you rationalize it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because the answer is already, like, the discrepancy is, the discrepancy is already, like, you know, rational, it's already characteristic zero. So if, if, if you like rationalize algebraic K theory, there's no, there's no difference. So you'll never get rid of this extra part. Okay. Right. I mean, of course you could, you could talk about finite coefficients, you know, right, if you want. Yeah, yeah. That's, and yeah, so what Bert said is also an alternative is that you can look at finite coefficients and everything is homotopy invariant and you're good. But uh, yeah, so this is another, another proof, another, another approach, I suppose. Right. Okay, yeah, so, um, right, so, so here's the result is that this funny square that, I don't know, just some square, uh, if I apply algebra K theory, is not quite Cartesian, but it's Cartesian after the inverse P. So here's the slogan, the only obstruction, right, here's the slogan, the only obstruction to K theory being UH invariant is indeed in characteristic zero. Right, so, so, so let me demonstrate this. So suppose that X and Y, is FP, right, it is over FP, so pure characteristic P, then these things are empty, right, the, the one over P part is empty, so you apply K, K empty to, M, to K empty, which is obviously an equivalence, but the theorem is Cartesian, so therefore X and KX and KY is an, is an equivalence after inverting P. So you get back the usual result, but yeah, so that's like, that's a, that's a basic, that's the basic idea. So the, the, the abstraction to being universal homeomorphism invariant is purely a QP addict or characteristic zero phenomenon. Okay, cool. Uh, right, so the inspiration like, yeah, so the story of this paper is that, uh, um, so, so, you know, Jakub has been thinking about this like, characteristic version of the minimum model program, which is if you, uh, well, you should read about it. I mean, I, I'm not an expert by any means, but it's very interesting. It's about how to classify uh, algebraic varieties in the same way that you, you classify curves in terms of like genus zero, genus one, and like higher genus, um, right? So, um, and whatever this, this MMP thing is, um, it involves selecting like nice line bundles. Uh, and um, to even begin the foundations of MMP uh, in, in mixed characteristic, uh, what Jakub has to do is to understand uh, how you how, how understand like you know line bundles in characteristic zero and line bundles in characteristic p, 
uh, and, and their difference. And uh, I'll make that precise in a moment, but let me just re review some um, notions about line bundles that if you're an algebraic geometer, you're probably an expert in, but if you're not, here's some review. So you have some, some, some map of schemes, probably no theory, and L is the line bundle on X. Okay, so then you say that L is F and F. If for, if for any field L, any, mel, any map spec L to S, the line bundle on like the pullback, Right, so X cross S over spec L is now a scheme over spec L. It's like NAF, which is not, if, which means that the degree on every curve running through X is like uh, non-negative. Okay, so that's like one nice property of line bundles. So here's another one, which is like more, uh, I guess, familiar to more people. So you say that F is free and, I mean, L is F free of, you know, the absolute situation is called base point free usually. So if the map, uh, if this map in this by the adjunction from f upper star f lower star of l is surjective, so you like you know like line bundles plus sections give you um, a rational map to project to space, and and if the map is actually a a map as opposed to a rational map, you you say that the base locus is empty, and you get a map from x to the projective by projectivization uh, to some projective space, but more concretely is given by f lower star of l. Okay, so there's base point three. I'm being sprayed by catnip, but uh, the talk continues. <laughs> okay, so, um, right, so then, um, so you say that L is semi ample, F semi ample or relatively semi ample, if, uh, if, if some high enough power of L is actually F3. Right, so it is maybe clear to like amateurs like me that you want semi ample line bundles. In other words, you want it because you want to choose coordinates, right? So. You know, instead of some abstract variety, you want to define a map to projective space, and you're lucky it's in fact a closed immersion. Then you can think about X as being embedded in some projective space, and just like choosing a coordinates as like select, selecting coordinates on X. And in fact, if you're semi ample, you're this thing called FNF. And the basic one of the basic questions you want to ask is like, when can I go from FNF to just to F semi ample? So if I have some FNF bundle, which is like some property about how you intersect curves running in X, you want to know if you can find a map to projective space. So here's a theorem that Yaku proof. So you have a projective morphism of ZP schemes. I mean, I guess this is, yeah, so ZP schemes. Um, and you have an L, you have an F net line bundle. So, so maybe here, to the, 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 um, what, it, what, what this theorem answers is the question of when is an F nef line, F semi ample. And the answer is the following. It is F semi ample if and only if you check on the reduced locus of X, you check on the QP locus of X, and it turns out to be F semi ample. So you look at the characteristic zero part, you look at the reduced part, and if these two, these two things are semi ample, then indeed you're semi ample. So hence, once we know semi ampleness on the reduced locus, the only ample obstruction lies entirely in characteristic zero. So that's like a very nice result. And the main technical like engine behind this result is the analog of our, our, our theorem, but with the Picard groupoid instead of, instead of algebraic K theory. So you look at the same square. So this is the same square as we saw for K, but the only difference is that I've replaced it with like PQ. So what you could prove is that this, this, this is indeed a pullback diagram, right? So X to Y is a universal homeo, right? So at this point, you might be asking what is the relationship between semi-ampleness and nafness with universal homeo? And for that, I, uh, you can ask Yakub or read, read the paper, but at some very important step in this proof uh, about the criterion for a line bundle being semi-ample, you have to consider universal homeos. And the main technical result to deal with that is this uh, pullback square uh, that that decompose that um, you know that says the obstruction for pick to be universal homeomorphism invariant, uh, at least rational pick, indeed lies in characteristic zero. Yeah. So the story is that uh, it came to me and um, uh, and like oh uh, you know what is an abstract formulation of this? And I thought about it for a bit, and then we went to a kill, and then uh, of course you know a kill is like super smart. So like he taught us like uh, what to do. 
And the missing piece was the fact that I knew something about the LDH topology from my years of looking at motivic stuff. And that was like the insight. So let me, um, let me, um, let me give a sketch of the proof of this result. But any, any questions so far? Right, so, so I, I don't, I, yeah. So, so which techniques goes into proving Jakob's result? You should ask Jakob. <laughs> so Jakob does have to look at Milner excision for Picard, for, for Pick. Uh, that was like one of the key inputs. So the, the proof that we have for K-theory is a bit different from, um, from the Picard version. Uh, so you don't use this his result, do you? It's just we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't. But we definitely, but I, I do that, but well, a prior version of this proof, so the, not the proof that I'm going to discuss in a moment, is purely inspired by the techniques of uh, what Jakob did for Pick. Right. And, and I'll, I'll talk about more, I'll talk more about this other approach uh, at the very end of the slide where I replaced Pick with Brewer. Brower. Okay. Okay. So here's a proof discussion. Uh, <coughs> as is always the case, you should you should consider uh, you, if you are, you're trying to measure some difference, so you take some fiber. Right? So we look at the pre sheaf that goes from schemes over ZP into spectra that sends X to the fiber of the map from KX to KX1 over P. So you should think about this as KX on P, namely the part of K3 of, of X which is concentrated and characteristic P. So that's a, that's a, you know, like a bad, a bad part of K theory maybe. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so that's, um, that's a, uh, yeah, so that's a pre-sheaf, okay. And um, the theorem is equivalent to saying that this thing is universal homeomorphism invariant. So, right, so the idea here, I mean, it's a very simple categorical maneuver, so you replace, Checking pullbacks with something being ISO. Okay, this is like completely trivial trick, but like everyone does this. Yeah, but I learned recently that Christian has some error, and it's like, yeah, this proof of like KH is LCDHK, or like rather the, homo the, the, the CDH descent for homotopy K theory has like the same style. Right? So if you want to prove that. To be K theory CDH descent, you look at some square, you want to know it's Cartesian. But that's very hard to verify something is Cartesian. Instead, you phrase it in terms of something being isomorphic, namely the map from KH to LCDHK. So it's like a very useful trick. Uh, and he says this explicitly in the introduction to his thesis. So really nice. Okay, cool. So, um, so we'll proceed by proving that he has descent with respect to a good trick topology where she's are indeed UH invariant, at least over ZP. And this is a version of Shane's LDH topology, and I will not go into the details of this version of the LDH topology, uh, except towards the end. But, uh, right, so, so um, but the point is that uh, what you want to show is that this has more descent, more, more um, descent than expected. Certainly more descent than K or, you know, K blank one over P. Okay, and this descent is with respect to this LDH topology, whatever that is. And whatever the LDH topology is, it turns out to be invariant with respect to the universal homeomorphism. With respect to universal homeomorphisms, at least over ZP. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's execute this, uh, or at least some parts of this, of this strategy. Okay, uh, right, um, right, sorry, sorry, one second, right. So the only thing you need to know for, for like the immediate discussion is that this LDH topology is finer than the CDH topology that was that already appeared in Vova's Vova's talk. Okay. So upon request, I can tell you what the CDH topology is, but if uh, everyone sort of knows what it is, I can move on. Any 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 request? Okay. Okay, so the relevance of the CDH topology is as follows. Okay. So you have this map, and if you take the spec of this, then it's this map, right? This uh, normalization of the cuspidal curve. So it is an example of a universal homeomorphism, but it is 
something better than just a universal homeomorphism, it is completely decomposed, which means the objective on all k points for all k. So it's like if like the CD explains like you know the CDness of the CDH topology or the CDness of the Nisevich topology. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, and any map of reduced rings, which is a completely decomposed universal homeomorphism, is in fact a filtered colimit of extensions of this form of like just t squared t cube into t. Okay. And this is the theorem of Swan. So um, the point is that this is a very basic form of universal homeomorphism, and you should address this form. But in fact, if you address this form, you can express any universal homeomorphism, which is uh, which is an extension of which is induced by an extension of rings, namely like the affine situation, into just into just you know universal homeomorphism of this form. So this is like the most basic universal homeomorphism that you should deal with. This, this is and this is just the case of the cuspidal curve. Okay, so let's let's look at something, right? So on the one hand, you can, uh, yeah. So so it turns out, I mean, it's kind of funny. So so you can look at this thing. And you can look at this closed immersion. So this is a finite map, and this is a closed immersion. All right, so you just uh, kill T6 or something. <laughs> and, uh, and, and this is a nil immersion. And in fact, this is an abstract blow up square. So that's something you should check that the complement, that the open complement is like an ISO. But once you check that, because this is a finite map, have when's proper. And this is a closed map, and this is a pullback diagram. This is a closed immersion. I mean, sorry, this is a CDH square, an abstract blob square. Sorry, this is like the name, abstract blob. So therefore, this is a CDH pushout. So of course, it's not a pushout of schemes, but it's a pushout in the CDH topology. And concretely, any CDH sheaf will convert uh, this square to a pullback. Okay, but now the vertical arrow is a nil immersion. And one of the things about the CDH topology is that uh, sheaves are nil invariant. So therefore, the right arrow is also a CDH equivalent. Right? So this is a nil immersion, as you can see from like, looking at these numbers, and this is an equivalence. This is a CDH equivalent, so this is a CDH equivalent. So therefore, finitary CDH sheaves are CDUH invariant. So if you only care about completely decomposed universal homeomorphisms, you, uh, you can just try to prove that something is CDH, something is a CDH sheaf. Okay, so let me let me roll back a bit on the strategy. So the strategy is to prove that this fiber, so this k x on p fiber, after I invert p, um, is universal homeomorphism invariant. So let's look at a special case, namely the completely decomposed ones, and look at a special case of the special case, which is this cuspidal curve. Okay, so this cuspidal curve is intimately related to the CDH topology. Uh, because um, because of this square, right? So it, it is like this 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 vertical vertical arrow in this uh, CDH square, and um, and right right. So be, and and in the CDH topology, because it's an abstract block square, it's a it's a push out. And furthermore, this back this this vertical arrow is a null immersion. Therefore, this is a, a isomorphism. All this is to convince you. Of a, of a potential argument that says finitary CDA sheaves, so those CDA sheaves that take filtered co filtered limits to filtered co limits, are invariant for not all universal homeomorphisms, but completely decomposed ones. Okay? So to verify that it's a CDA sheaf, there's an obvious strategy. Um, so since there's only 10 minutes left, let me sort of, uh, um, you know, appeal to your knowledge of this very. Uh, Awesome paper of Lantama. So Lantama proved, tells us the following. And there is uh, a question, wait a sec. Yes. Uh, Bob asks, okay, there is finitary uh, CDH sheet. What's, it, what's the condition for finitary? Okay. Finitary takes co-filtered limits to filtered co-limits. So you need, you need to play well with notarian approximations. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So to prove something as a CDA shift, there is a strategy that you know that you should first think about when you deal with like K theory and things like this. You need to prove that this invariance, this uh, this invariance, is uh, you know 
what do you call this? Uh, truncating. Namely, if I evaluate this invariant on any E1 ring, an active E1 ring, then uh, there's no difference between A and its pi zero. It's like a nil invariant statement. And Lantama proved that in this case, uh, we have a CDH sheet. So, so let me let me note that there is no chance for I mean K theory blank one over P is not a CDA sheaf. However, this funny fiber is okay. Well, on Z, on on schemes of a ZP. So there's a there's a there's something going on there. So how do you prove this? Okay, so to prove this, you draw the following three by three square. Okay, so so let me talk through this square. Okay, so you have Ka and then K1 over P. So this is just like uh, the map from K, algebra K theory of A to K theory of A in characteristic zero. So the fiber is what I've been calling Ka on P, which is the algebra K theory of A at characteristic P. There's the same, ver there's the same version for pi zero. So this is the pi zero version of the middle, of the middle diagram, of the middle uh, sequence. So I just look at pi zero, pi zero, yeah. And um, the goal was to, so you want to show that this is an equivalence. Um, so what you do is you take the fiber, you want to show that this is zero. But then what you, you, what you do is you take the fiber of these maps as well. Take the, so this is, the, this is also fiber and fiber of this, of these two, of this two maps respectively. Okay, so you have a three by three diagram, you have like these nine things, and you want to show that this is zero and everything is exact, everything is a cofiber sequence. So to show that it's zero is equivalent to showing that this is zero. These two things are equivalent. Okay. So you have a chance at doing this actually, because it boils down to the following quite concrete statement. So instead of, so, um, so reduce from, trying to understand the difference between A to pi zero of A between two ring spectra to just square zero extensions of like discrete rings. So this is a, this is a standard technique. I guess maybe the first person to do this to my knowledge is good really. Uh, when he tried, when he was proving this like um, uh, rational version of Dundas, Dewey, and McCarthy. So if you look at the fiber here, you look at K-theory and think about K-theory as not as K-theory, but a more basic thing, namely BGL, then uh, what you wanna do is you wanna prove that you take BGL of A relative to M, take BGL of A relative to M1 over P, and take BGL of A1 over P relative to M1 over P, and you wanna show that this three maps is an equivalence after inverting P. Okay. So that's ultimately what it is, and this is um, some, well, I would say uh, an, uh, an exercise in, in algebraic topology, just like tracing through what all this means. Okay, so uh, I don't have time to go into the detail, but this is, um, it boils down to a, just a statement about a rather concrete classifying spaces or relative versions of classifying spaces of discrete rings. Okay, so stare at that for a moment. Okay, right. and. So, so this, uh, this, this is what, uh, you know, af after the appropriate class construction or whatever procedure, this gives you this F of A, which, is, which appears here. And this thing gives you F prime prime of A, which appears as the fiber below. Alton, yes. Vava asks you if this is the idea of a kill's proof, but I'm not sure what he means by a kill's proof. Yes. <laughs> What does he mean by Achilles? Yes, is my answer. I don't know. Like, is this Achilles trick? Yes. Okay, Vava, well, just ask yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm asking about that paper, about, yeah, that paper of Achilles that you mentioned before. Uh, Wait, call, call was that? Achilles, Achilles Matthew, yeah. Which, which paper, by the way? Uh, the, the one about the, 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 so if you have a map of scheme over Z, Z, ZP and you ask about there, there the dead square. Or oh, Jakub's Jakub's proof. That's Jakub's paper. Wittashek. Mm, no, wait. Uh, 
Well, okay, maybe I'll ask you later because it was too many slides ago. Okay. Well, no, the thing is, there was just a kills photo, but this is their joint. Yeah, it's photo. just a kills photo. So, right, right, right. So, but okay, like okay. for for the experts in trace methods, this is like line 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 one or line two of the John Dust Good William McCarthy proof. Like literally, yeah, this is line. I mean, this is similar to line one or line two. <laughs> right. Anyway. Uh, Sorry, not Dundas Goodwill McCarthy, the original Goodwill proof, the rational version, right? Like where you have this pullback square that involved HC minus. This, this is like the same kind of like spaces that you have to look at. So I would say this is like Goodwill is proof. <laughs> okay. So, so to deal with general universal homeomorphism, it turns out there's only a different type. So there's this type where, you know, previously you look at this almost semi normalization case, and there's also this case which is in characteristic P. So ZP, P times T, and T to the P mapping to ZPT. The, ana the analog of the previous CDH square is the following one. Uh, so you look at this closed immersion where you mod out by P, mod by P, and you take this pullback, and it turns out to be spec FPT, and this map is just a Frobenius. So if you are, in, if you are, if you, are uh, if you convert Frobenii to universal homeomorphisms, then you're good, you're, you're good because again, this is a push out. This time with respect to an appropriate version of the LDH topology. So if this is an ISO, then this is also an ISO. So that's like the same game and everything breaks down to these two cases. Okay, and this is where you need a, a version of chains LDH topology. So let's call the previous argument like Kelly and call this argument Goodwilly. I mean, sorry, the previous version Goodwilly and the previous, this argument Kelly. Okay. So right, what's in progress, which like, I've been thinking about and started on the, uh, proving wrong statements uh, for the past, I don't know, two weeks, <laughs> uh, is that uh, there should be a, a similar story for a version of the Brower stack. So you look at the Brower group, I mean the Brower stack, because pi zero is the, you know, the Brower group, uh, the big one, I mean, the one with Q, the one with like not torsion. <laughs> so this classifies, uh, uh, derive Azumai algebras if you like. Uh, and um, yeah, so this would be like a, a Brouwer version of uh, Jakub's uh, result topic. And a start would be to establish no excision for the Brouwer stack and um, the details have to be checked. And um, if you were to ask me, I can say something about it, but uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Eldon. I'd like to make one super short announcement before everyone leaves or runs away, and then everyone can ask Eldon questions. So if you're at this conference and for some reason you did not bother to register, please do register after the conference just to make us happy to know who actually was at the conference. It, it doesn't matter if your name is Martin or not, but Martin, this is a question. Right. Okay, uh, thank you. Now, there are many questions. So, uh, Harry wanted to ask a question. Harry? Uh, yeah, um, what is the, what additional maps do you need to, or what additional covers do you need for the LDH topology from the CDH topology? Uh, right, so you need, um, well, you need flat FPPF covers uh, of a certain degree. Finite, finite flat of a certain degree. Okay, thanks. Um, I think there was someone, some other question. Uh, I can see a second raised hand. Yeah, I'll try to like, sort of, so, so uh, one sort of silly question is um, that you had this assumption that you had schemes over the periodic integers, I think. But I mean, I yes. guess maybe that assumption could just be omitted, right? Because K theory, sort of at the prime P, it should sort of only depend on the completion of your ring, so to speak, Does that, at P, does that make sense? Um, can, can you repeat that, sorry? Well, if you're, if essentially, you're, you're only talking about K theory of your rings at the prime P, in the sense you said. Yes. And basically that should sort of only depend on the completion of your ring at P, so, you know, so you should be able to go from the result for to, over the periodic integers to just the same result, you know. Just for any scheme. Oh, oh, I see. I see what you mean. You go, you go, you go to spec Z, and then you complete at P. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, it's it, 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 it
thanks, thanks. Yeah, that, 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 that's very reasonable. Okay, and then another, maybe more interesting about hopeless thing is, uh, you know, well, you know, since you can do everything nowadays over for any um, anything in SH, you know, any any cohomology theory. Uh, right. What about that? <laughs> yeah. So the 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 paper with Adil uh, shows that uh, if you invert the residual primes, uh, you always get um, you always get you you show that. SH is UH in invariant always. Yeah, but I mean, of course, K theory is not representable in uh, in SH, but, rather it's yeah. KH. Yeah. So it, this is a quite different thing. Eldon, and you don't have to invert P for that, right? Well, you have to invert the residual characteristics. Ah, okay. So if you have classic zero, it's just no, you don't have to invert anything. Okay. Uh, any more questions? If there are no more questions, I'm going to get a cat. So. <laughs> okay, it's your last chance, people, to ask Eldon a question. Yes. And if not, let's thank Eldon again. <laughs> thank you all for coming. It was fun. Hope you enjoyed. We will post videos tomorrow, and we'll see you at the next edition. I can also be very unhumble and thank Dennis and myself for organizing the conference. Yeah. <laughs> I think we should all give a round of applause for you. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was great to have you all and see you next time. But actually you can stay and chat with us if you want for some reason. Well, at least I don't have a cat, I have a toy.